So we've got, we've got somebody with a uh, roving mic. So if, you, if I don't see you, raise your hand. So you got an opportunity to, you know, whatever is going on in your practice, if you've got a, if you've got a case um, you, wanna, you want me to see. In fact, I might even just, uh, I was just shown a case, and so I might just tell you a little bit about that. It's uh, somebody that uh, I've never seen it before, but had some, can I just, without using a name, can I describe the case? Kelly, okay, so, uh, so she just showed me this picture of uh, somebody that had been given 5-FU for their legs. Uh, I've only seen it used on the face now that I'm thinking about it. I've never seen it used on the body, but I, I don't know. The, uh, somebody gave it to her, and she just put it on every one of her little AKs on her legs, and everywhere uh, she put it, she got a full thickness burn. Uh, I've never seen anything like it, really. So now she's left with some deeper scarring, and... Um, and then she's got still got sun damage on her on her leg as well. And she said, you know, how uh, she threw me a softball question to start, and then she said, this next one's going to be hard. And so uh, she was right. So how would you take care of that? So now you've got a leg that's got sun damage and dyschromia, um, and then you've got some uh, scars that are flat. Uh, some are a little bit deeper and depressed, and they're hypopigmented. So. Uh, Interestingly, he went back to the doctor that gave it to her, and he said, there's nothing I can do. You just need to go home. I mean, which I don't know how that works out for most people. But anyway, uh, uh, that's, I'm sure he didn't really know what to do. But what I told her and what I would suggest is that I would, there's two ways to approach it. You can treat the non-scarred areas with Halo Moxie, the, 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 the hero. Not said Halo. Sorry, forget what I said. BBL Hero Moxie combination and try to get that as, as light as you can, which will decrease the disparity. So if you, if you were listening today about the different things about how you treat scars in the slide I showed you, then this is what I would do. On those white scars, it's meticulous, but if somebody wants to spend the time to do it, this is a doctor's wife uh, apparently, and, and so if you want to spend the time to do it, you know, uh, then you would, I would go in and do profractional in those white scars. And if they were hypotrophic, if they were depressed, uh, Jill, shown some, Jill Weibel shown some nice results if she drips Sculptra in there. Uh, uh, and, 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 and actually, I didn't mention that to you, Kelly, but the, the, you can actually, if they're hypo, hypotrophic, if they're depressed, you can, you can uh, punch holes in them and then put some Sculptra in uh, repeatedly, and it'll, it'll plump up those hypotrophic scars. The other thing you can do for the hypopigmentation is you can uh, profractionate them and then drip Latisse in. So you give them a prescription of Latisse before uh, uh, they come in, and so they have it with them, and you put it on immediately through the holes. Uh, I wouldn't do Sculpture and Latisse at the same time. You just have to kind of pick, you know, one visit they do one, one visit do the other. And, uh, and not everybody responds to Latisse 100% of the time, but it's a really easy way to do it, and then you just go BID, and then they just keep plying it, and then they maybe come in once a month for more fractionated treatments, and then you just keep applying the Latisse twice, twice a day. And uh, I would tell them that I don't know that I'll totally fix your legs, but I believe that you could, uh, you could, you, you know, those are just, just, just the fact that I could even tell you that, that we didn't even have those things available five years ago where we were doing any of this stuff for the lower extremity. So, um, that's kind of what I would do on that case. So if you have some other cases that you got a question here, yes, ma'am, we got one over here. Uh, we'll take that. And anything you want to talk about from what I've learned in business or what make, what separates med spas or clinical cases or, you know, whatever. Yes, ma'am. How would you treat hemocytorin staining? Hemocytorin staining is very, very tough. Hemocytorin stain is probably the toughest thing, but we treat that kind of like a tattoo. Uh, so hemocytorin, uh, you, you would try, I would try a Q-switch laser on hemocytorin stain. It's, I treat it just like a tattoo. You're just tattooing the skin with iron, and I can't guarantee you can get rid of it, but that's the best way to go about it. There's a new, there's a new uh, product that's coming out that you'll hear about. Uh, Allergan just bought uh, a company called uh, Soliton, uh, and, their, and their device is called uh, Resonix, and uh, uh, we're supposed to get ours... Uh, soon, um, but it is, uh, the people behind it are super smart, um, 
they sold the company for $550 million before they even shipped a unit. It's just amazing. It's crazy. So that's either crazy or it's really good. I don't know. But I, will, I have seen their pictures, and uh, it's a photoacoustic wave. It sounds like you know what, you, you're shaking your head. You know what I'm talking about. So it actually enhances any, any uh, tattoo removal, and, and, and uh, it's, a, it's, it's super high-end energy, and it's super rapid in frequency. There's nothing on the market like it. It's a total, uh, total new uh, mechanism of action. And so that is something I would look at that maybe we could combine the Resonics and a Q-switch YAG or, or some kind of Q-switch laser that would help the hemosiderin. But at the end of the day, uh, before I ever started and embarked on hemosiderin, I would, I would just tell them that I don't know that I could help you, but I would try those things. Sometimes you can get lucky. But if you try to treat that with a Moxie, you, you're confusing. If you confuse hemosiderin with uh, PIH, it's not gonna help hemosiderin as well. That's one of the things I, just by the way, that's one of the things I don't like about Quo is just, you know, there's so much, so much bruising and you're going to get hemosiderin deposits and those are really hard to get rid of. So, yeah, was there another question here in the front? Oh, yeah. Um, how, do you use TRL to, for skin tag removal? And if so. Skin tag removal? For skin tag removal. Yeah, you could use, uh, you could use TRL for anything, but honestly, skin tags, lesions, what I tend to do is just for the sake of time, you know, I just snip them off, shave them off, seborrheic, skin tags, whatever it is, and then I'll take the TRL, or even if it's a mole. Let's say you have a mole that you, that, that you, first of all, I'm not a dermatologist. My daughter's a dermatologist, and, you know, her daddy knows nothing about dermatology. She makes that clear to me all the time. And so, uh, you know, uh, I, I usually get them screened before I treat them. So if, if, they're, if they're trained, they're screened, and they've got their little fancy lights, and, 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 uh, um, and I think they're incredibly valuable. So I, I have great relationships with my dermatologist. So I want them to go and make sure that those things are benign, first of all. If you don't know that a lesion's benign, you shouldn't be messing with it, because one of these days, over the course of 30 years, it's going to come back and bite you. So having said that, if you have a fleshy mole, like a neural nevus or something like that, and you just shave it off, or if you shave off a junctional nevus that, that your dermatologist says is not a problem, then, then what you can do there is you can, you can excise them, but that's going to leave a scar. But if you just excise them and then take your TRL and then just set it on 30 microns, uh, hertz of about whatever you're comfortable with, and then, just, uh, uh, and then you just go over those uh, lesions and you smooth them right out and make them super smooth. Because, you know, sometimes if you get a shave, you'll, get a you'll see somebody come in and they've got a depression. So... In this way, you just shave them, make sure you don't scoop it out. You just shave it flat. You could even leave a little bit, and then you can just, just smooth that right down with the TRL. The, the using COAG? Um, I tend to not use a lot of COAG. The, the laser is fantastic, but I tend to not use a whole lot of COAG. Uh, we did a study, um, oh, God, I don't know, a million years ago. But we... we uh, we found there's two things that, 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 that are affected, that affect hypopigmentation. And I had, I did, I think I did 102 patients and I had three hypopigmentations. And every one of them I used 50 microns of coag. And so I've been backing off the coag because of that. And I don't really need it. People complain, I mean, I, people complain about uh, the bleeding with an erbium laser uh, and I just, I, you know, I don't. I just, I don't see it. It's not, it's just not much of a problem for me. I mean, you, they bleed and whatever, but it, you know, as a surgeon, if you saw how much blood there is on some of these operations, it just doesn't bother you. And the point is, what you do is you just put, you know, look, if they're bleeding on their cheek, you just, you put pressure on it, you wipe it off, you put pressure, it stops the bleeding, you keep laser, and you laser through that. And if you're going to a bleeding endpoint, um, it'll stop any bleeding that, ha I've had profuse bleeding, like you get a redhead, right? I love redheads, but I don't like operating on them. They bleed, and they and uh, and so uh, they all stop within just a few minutes after the surgery or after the laser. So uh, I don't use a lot of coag, but you could use coag. It doesn't. It's not a big not a big deal to, to use it. I just can't see the endpoint if I use coag. Anything else? Oh, hit it with the coag on the, uh, 
Yeah, you're saying if it's, if it's bleeding, you've already gone down there and you're hitting with the coag. My point is, is that, yeah, that would stop the bleeding, but if you hold pressure for, or just wait, it'll stop. You put a Band-Aid on it, seriously. And that way, you're just eliminating the complications. You know, you, you might not have any complication with that, and it might be a really great way to do it, but if you, if you, can, avoid, if you can avoid heat that's unnecessary, that's what I would do, personally. Yeah, you got a question here behind you. They're on Accutane right now, um, you know, but they have the, you know, the keloidal scarring, hypotrophic, um, scar, I mean, sorry, atrophic scarring on the back and center chest. What is there that you can do? I mean, because, you know, you also don't want to cause, you know, that much injury to cause more keloids. So, I mean, is there anything that, that yeah. you've done for those? Yeah, yeah, there is. Uh, Jill uh, Wobble, again, speaks a lot about treating keloids, and she does it exactly uh, that way. She'll actually shave the keloid flush. Um, and then uh, profractionate it and then drip the steroid directly into that. And I usually use 40 milligrams. I go, like if I'm injecting a, 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 a lesion, I personally don't want to get, I don't want to overdo it. So I'll, I'll, I'll typically will take 10 of Kenalog and dilute it in half. When I, the very first time I inject any scar, I start with five because I know that's the lowest dose. And if I can get in a result, sometimes I'll be super surprised even with a thicker scar where it'll it'll really flatten out decrease the redness decrease the itching um, and so i'll start with five or ten or whatever but i don't go to 40 unless i'm dripping steroids into a fractionated treatment because you're only treating part of it and then for, you need 40 and then when that when that lesion starts getting smaller and you're you may be injecting it initially then when that lesion gets smaller then basically what you can do is then you can switch over to the to the profractionated and dripping it in so you won't get as much overdone. And you can even, at the end of that, you could even fractionate it and switch over to 5-FU. Uh, again, it's Jill's trick, not mine. But you can do all of those things to those scars. And if you just stay in those scars and treat them that way, I think you'll see some improvement. And the hypotrophic scars that are, that are, that are that you can uh, get, do exactly what we were talking about in terms of profractionating it. And, uh, but you're really only talking about 11% Right? You're talking about 11%, and then I just look how deep the scar is, and I just guess. If it's a really thick scar, I might go eight or 900 microns, but if it's a superficial scar, I might only go three or 400 microns. But I don't usually go over 11% uh, on the trunk. Uh, if it's on the face, I can do uh, two passes at 11%. Yeah. How often do you do that? Go down to, you know, 700, you know, and when we treat acne scars on the face, I mean, on the on the back, you know, could that be beneficial if, you know, once I inject it and, and get it flat and then... Um it, it, it could be beneficial. Any kind of a non... But see, Halo, the 1470 is non-ablative to 700, so you don't really have a hole to drip it into. Right. You, so that's the difference. And so uh, I was, somebody was telling me uh, uh, in the past, you know, you could do... The profractional is the Cadillac for sure. But what are other ways you could get it in there? Anything that punches a hole in the skin would help you. Sure. So you could do microneedling. Yeah. Uh, you could even maybe do microneedling RF, but I worry a little bit about putting that much heat in, the, in, the, in, a, in a person that tends to, to, to uh, keloid anyway. Because I really believe that, and, and I think it's been, uh, I was on a panel with some dermatologists and I threw this out and they said, yeah, man, there's been studies to prove what, you're, what, you've, what you've observed. Because when, I, when I've observed something, you know, you think these people get acne scarring because they've got the worst acne. That's not true. People can have horrible acne and not have much scarring. And people can have mild acne and get a lot of scarring. I think the scarring is more important than the acne and how you scar. And that's been, apparently, that's been, that's been proven. Uh, uh, I can't remember if it was bitter or somebody was, was educating me about that study that showed that was true. No, I knew it was. It was Jill Wobble. And uh, it was when I interviewed her. And so uh, she was telling me that that's been proven as well. So if I'm treating an acne patient and I've got to do excisions or subcisions or anything like that, I tell them that very story. I say, look, I can help you. Uh, you came to me because I'm kind of that guy to help. I think, you know, got the lasers and the whole deal. But I'm just going to tell you, it's a, it's a huge journey. And if I punch 10 lesions out of you, six will get better, two will be uh, the same, and two will be worse. So we might t take one step forward, or sorry, two steps forward and one back, and two steps forward and one back, 
And we just gotta, we've got to work through that. It's a, it's a multimodality area to treat acne. Acne is really, uh, really a challenge. But I, you can do it, for sure. All the things you've learned today, you can do that. Thank yeah, you. You bet. Anything else? Any other questions out there? Okay. SKs on the body. Hold on one second. I'm sorry. I'll have him come up. After she gets through, this one down here. But go ahead. What was that question again? What is your go-to for SKs on the body? Severe keratosis? Have, yeah. Oh, yeah. I just, I just yeah. shave those. I, I, I just shave those with a blade. And... And, and if, you're, if you're super light with, uh, with the uh, erbium, you can just, you know, if there's any kind of, you know, if you shave it and there's a little ragged edge or something, you can just smooth that out. Just, just uh, you know, you realize that, that, that um, your scanner on the erbium is set, this is really getting, this is getting into the laser geek kind of thing uh, that, that Hobart and Negus and I worked out in 2000, because I noticed that, uh, I'm going to answer your question, but, uh, I'm just going to try to educate a little bit. Yeah, thanks. So uh, what I'm trying to say is if you use a CO2, think about a stick of butter, okay? If, if the CO2 can't ablate it and you have to sit there and stack it, it's going to melt the butter. That's what, it, that's what it does. It melts your dermis because it can't ablate it. The erbium is like a cookie cutter. It actually ablates it. So what I was noticing when I switched over from CO2 to erbium, I told Jim, I said, Jim, what I'm seeing here is that I've gotten more splotchy. I'm not sure our overlap is right. So he went through all of these freaking machinations to figure out that the perfect overlap for an erbium laser is 50%. So that's built into every one of the jewels or anytime you use a contour, 50% overlap is what your scanner is doing because we figured that out. I mean, I, I, what I'm good at is, is creating problems, and Jim's good at fixing them, so he figured that out. So when you have a 30, when you're using that 30 micron spot size that I told you, I'm sorry, when you're using that four millimeter spot size manually, then you want to pick a Hertz rate, uh, and maybe I could show you. Did you have a Jewel, do you, you guys have a Jewel X or back here working? Yeah, so I could show you that. Uh, if we turn the camera on, I could go back there and show you. It's actually a pretty good tool. But if you look at it, um, you want to overlap 50% when you're moving it manually. So anytime I can use a scanner, um, you want to use it because we're humans. No matter how good you are, you can never do it as precisely as a machine. So, but you can't do the things with a scanner you need to do on, on, on these lesions. So, so now I'm back to your question. So you want to overlap 50% when you're, when you're doing that. Because if you camp in one place, you're going, to get a, you're going to get a depression. So set your device, take a tongue blade, and get to the point where you pick a, something that makes you feel comfortable where you can overlap at 50%. You can do a circle, but it, it, ought, to, it ought to overlap like Olympic rings, 50%, and then it'll be smooth. If you, if you don't overlap it, it's a cookie cutter, so you're going to get edges where it's not. So when you're treating a lesion that's a circle, you want to manually treat that as if it was a scanner of 50%. That's something that's overlooked a lot because you, you, know, you can smooth it as long as you realize that, that, that scenario. Does that make any sense or was that way overboard? Yeah, any, anything like that. So my point is if, you have a, if, you have the, if the lesion is four, because you do have two hand pieces, you have a two millimeter and a four millimeter. The reason, Jason likes the two millimeter. I don't like the two millimeter because it's harder to overlap. The smaller the spot size, I mean, if in an ideal world, we're, if, we're if we're gaining ground on lasers, then what we want to do is we want to walk into a booth and have a spot size the size of our body, and we just, boom, you know, that's what we want. That's what we want. So it, it's, it's, that's, the, that's what we want. But the point is, so let's say you had a, a mole or a seb, seb K. Let's say you have a seb K. If that seb K is less than four millimeters, then... You can't, you can't really do that well. You're going to dig a moat around the sub K. If a lesion's less than four millimeters and you're trying to knock it down, it's, it, it's too small. So what I do is I just shave it, and then, I, then I, that's how I treat it. That's what I do. So, yeah. And you can use the two, but so if you had a smaller one, I guess you could use it. But I just think you can get into more trouble with that two millimeter. You got to really, if you're Jason, you can use it. Uh, but I, you know, I don't use it a whole lot. Be honest, you, you, when I use it, 
I'll use it if I really want to be fancy and show off. It's a cool way of doing it. Uh, you can actually unroof sebaceous hyperplasias, and you can. Uh, somebody asked me that, so I might, I might as well tell you how, to, how I treat sebaceous hyperplasias. I shave them off. This is, this is my hierarchy of how I treated sebaceous hyperplasias. I shaved them off, and I thought that was enough, and it scared me to go any more than that it, it, when I first started trying to treat them, and they recurred in the recovery room. I mean, they just, they're back. So then I shaved them, and I got a small curette. Kelly, what's the size of that little curette? Two-millimeter curette. So it's, a, it's, a, it's just a two-millimeter curette. So then I would scoop it out, okay? And then it would, wouldn't come back for a year or two. And then my daughter tell me, Dad, we just hyfricate those, and they stay gone a long time. So now what I do is I do all of that. I shave them, hyfricate them, I stick a 30-gauge needle in them, and I hit it with a bovie, and they shrink. And, and I worried about the pit, never seen a problem. I've never seen a hole from a curating a sebaceous hyperplasia, never. And, I've, and I hit it until it shrink, kind of shrinks about it, and you say, oh, my gosh, am I going to get a burn there and a scar? I assume it could happen, but I've done hundreds of them. I've never seen it be a problem, that you're just hyfricating those things. And then they're gone. I mean, a lot of them are gone. I mean, I haven't seen them back. So that's how I treat sebaceous hyperplasia. So if you wanted to be fancy, you could take a two-millimeter uh, spot size and then just core it out and then hyfricate it or something like that. You, I, I'm not even sure you couldn't uh, – I'm not even sure you couldn't uh, – um, Maybe use coag with that, and that'd be maybe that's all you'd need to do. I haven't ever tried that, but 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 that's that. Those are just some options for that. I'm not sure I answered your question, but that's how I do it. Uh, you had a question. Uh huh. In the halo with the fourteen seventy and the twenty nine forty, both the ablative with the non ablative. How would that differ from the profractional if you were wanting yeah. to? So the halo, the halo is a four, okay. So the halo delivers a fourteen seventy nanometer uh, wavelength in the infrared spectrum, and it doesn't see any. It really doesn't see much chromophore. It, it's it just it and it penetrates about six or seven hundred microns. That's all you're going to get with a fourteen seventy. Uh, at max power. That's just what it does. It goes six, 600 microns deep. And then the, the erbium on that device is set to 100, okay? So that's as deep as you can go. The profrac, so you ablate a hundred, so you, you've got a, you've got a, my arm is the core to 600 microns, and then you can ab ablate the depth of my wrist there, you know, that, so you've got a little shallow hold. And um, so that's how that works. And uh, so you get, you get new collagen formation by heating the dermis, and then you get new collagen formation by causing an intraepidermal injury. Remember I told you how Halo educated me to that fact? Jay Oringer did a paper that was fantastic, and he showed if you do an intraepidermal injury, it actually stimulates cytokines of all kinds, lamellin, tropocollagen, um, uh, cytochrome P. It, it basically, it goes down into the dermis and creates new collagen. So you've got a couple of different ways. That's how that works. But it doesn't work really great for drug delivery because you're really only going 20 to 40 microns with the, you don't have a hole. And so profractional, you can, you can set the profractional for, you can go deep. You know, you can go six, seven, 800, 900 microns deep with that profractional device. Because the chromophore is water and erbium is, loves water. So you can just punch a hole right through the skin. So it's different technology. That makes sense? Yeah. Yep. What else? Okay. It's going to get boring without questions. You're going to have to talk amongst yourself. All right. So uh, any, any questions on starting up a practice or business or marketing techniques or using the data, you know, anything like that? Okay, she wanted me to go over treating the island technique again. So, uh, yeah, the island technique is um, the island technique is uh, where I just I go over, I, I get down to I get down to a level that I you know I, I can tell the wrinkles are really deep, um, and I go down to around 250 microns, something like that. So maybe. I'll set the laser on 120, 130, 140 microns, and I'll do two passes on the lip. Now, some people ask me, could you just set it on 
280 and go one time. And you could. Uh, usually I'm teaching residents or whatever, and I've just done it for so long. Uh, you could absolutely do that. I don't think it would really matter, to be honest with you. And the more I'm right in the middle of this sentence, I'm not sure I wouldn't start doing that. But anyway, um, you could do it. Uh, because really the whole, pr the whole, uh, um, the only, f I mean, to me, treating with Profrac is not, it's not all that fun, right? I mean, it's just, you set a setting and you just, you just, you know, you just, you're a technician. And there's nothing wrong with technicians. There's a million of them in the room. I'm a technician, but it's just not anything really fun. What's really fun for me is individualizing the treatment with that manual spot size. And I'm treating just like I told you how to treat the, the, uh, the little sub K or something. I'm overlapping that, 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 uh, uh, four millimeter spot size at a 30 micron depth. You could set it at 20, you could set it at 40. It's just, I just kind of settled it. 30 seemed to be reasonable. I've used it for 20 years and so that's what I do. But, and I use it at a, at a rep rate of about eight. But, but I make my residents start at three or four because I just don't think they can do it and overlap as quickly. And some are better than others. Um, you might be able to go at 10. If I'm doing a rhinophyma, I set the thing at freaking, you know, 20 or 30, you know, because I want to get that thing off there. You'll be there all day at, at, a, at a rep rate of six or eight. So anyway, now I've got it down there to 250 microns roughly, and then I just take each wrinkle and I hit, I hit the sides of those wrinkles. Uh, if, this is, if this is the wrinkle, I'll hit on each, each side of the wrinkle two or three times. And you can literally, the cool thing about this laser, this is where it gets fun, you can literally see the tissue melting away. And then, you, and then once I do that, I'll go over the wrinkle just because I'm trying to smooth it a little bit. But if I go two or three or four or five passes on the hills, I'll go across the valley once just to blend it. And then I just keep doing that till the wrinkle's gone away. And I'll keep wiping it off. And if I get to the point where those blood vessels uh, get further apart and larger, and I'm at the mid-reticular bleeder, I stop. Or if the wrinkle's gone, I stop. But what I do is if the wrinkle's gone, I'm getting right. I'm getting deep into the weeds here, right? So after the after the wrinkle's gone, you learn all this at the preceptorship. But if you, if I get down there, one of the things I've learned is there'll be a, there's not a whole lot of heat. There's five to twenty microns of heat associated with the ablation wound. So if you ablate a wound, then around that ablation and underneath it is five to twenty microns. CO2, seventy to one hundred and twenty microns. So it's a lot of char. There's hardly any. So basically what I'll do is I will uh, uh, go down there and, and uh, uh, I don't have a whole lot of, I don't have a, I'll, I'll have some bleeding and that's why even at five or 20 microns of char, you'll still see a bleeding pattern. And when I get down to that, that level, um, then I stop. But if I'm down to the wrinkle and it's gone, there's enough char that I have to wait a minute to see the bleeding pattern. So I'll come back, if that wrinkle is gone, um, I will hydrate it and let it sit, make sure I'm really hydrated because I could have shrunk it down from the dryness. I'm that meticulous about it. I will literally, when I, when I think the wrinkle's gone, I'll rehydrate it, wipe that off, give it a couple of three minutes, and occasionally I'll see that old wrinkle just got about 5% left in it, so I'll go back and smoke it again. Yep, until it's gone. And that's the difference in... To me, that's the difference in the results I had in some of my original papers where I was getting 60 to 70% improvement. And now, if I don't feel like I'm getting 80 to 95% improvement of those wrinkles, uh, I, I feel like I've failed the patient. Because I, 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 that's just one of the things that I think we can deliver if we do it well. But it takes that kind of staying after it. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Odie. Yeah. A lot of people ask that question. Do you go, you know, a, a plastic surgeon, this whole... The whole, pr this is the lip. This is the vermilion. Most of the, the lay people will say the vermilion is the lip. But the whole, everything from your nose to your, you know, your teeth is the lip, right? So she's asking, do you go over the vermilion border? And you can 100% go over the vermilion border. You're trying to get rid of the wrinkle. And if the wrinkle goes to the vermilion border and it goes over the vermilion border. Now, it'll never go onto the, you know, there's the, there's the, there's the wet mucosa and there's the dry mucosa. So a wrinkle won't go into the wet mucosa, okay? But a wrinkle can go all the way to the wet mucosa through the dry mucosa. And if you have that, 
you, you take it all the way down there because you want to you get that whole wrinkle because if you leave the wrinkle in the dry mucosa, it's the history. It, 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 it's it's going to bend there again, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to ride up, and your, your wrinkle will recur more. So I'll take it all the way over into the vermilion, and it's raw, and it's not... You know, it's not fun, but nothing's fun. So they don't, they don't know that you didn't, did that. So you just got, and you need to treat them like that. And that'll be the, that also adds, these are the little things that take you from 70% wrinkle improvement to 95% wrinkle improvement. Wiping it down, making sure you got it, making double sure you've got it, going to the end point, the ventricular bleeding, going across the vermilion, uh, that kind of thing. And then, yeah, then, yeah. Yes, ma'am, over here. Cool sculpting? Yeah. Yeah, you can talk about, listen, you can talk about anything. You know what, they've got, they got people talking about TikTok, and so we can darn sure talk about cool sculpting. So whatever you want to talk about, yeah. I'll repeat, I'll repeat the question. So she was, uh, she was asking, do we ever treat, uh, you know, somebody that's breastfeeding uh, with cool sculpting? And I don't, I can't think of any contraindications for that. Uh, do, do you, Kelly? I mean, we, we probably don't do it just because, but just because, here's, here's the issue with, it depends on how you're wired. I don't know, uh, I mean, I think, I mean, I'm defending, I mean, I'm the legal, I'm, you know, I've read, I've read as much about cool sculpting as probably anybody because I defend, I've, I'm in this class action thing. Allergan's getting sued every other Wednesday, you know, for everything. And so I just happen to be their expert on cool sculpting. So I've just reviewed everything I think ever been written about it. And I don't know that there's a, a true contraindication. We tend not to do that just because of the emotion of it. And if anything happens, you know, then 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 you don't know, and it's just it's just a, it's emotional, and and like I told you, I want my I want truth to determine the emotion, and I'm sure, I'm sure we could get out of it, but I'm not interested in getting in some kind of a legal battle. So we tend not to treat pregnant people just like I did up here. I mean, uh, and we you know we love them, but you know let's let them get through all that. But I don't know of any contraindication. I, I just don't know that I, I have that. One more question. Oops, I guess uh, you can hear me now. If somebody, if you've treated somebody with cool sculpting numerous times for their inner thighs, have you ever considered using Kybella? Because I know Kybella is coming out with all sorts of off-label new uses. I know we use it for the back fat, uh -huh. raw fat. But ha have you ever treated it for, the, used Kybella for the inner thighs? I try to avoid Kybella like the plague. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't understand it. It, Allergan had lost their butt on Kybella. They spent so. Uh, look at that. They... Yeah. The hoot, what happened? All right. Well, this will be the final question, then we're going to get kind of the stage going again. But keep rocking, Jay. That's fine. Okay. Sorry. Oh, there you go. Got it. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, it, I, I'm trying to make a point there. And I've been on the advisory boards, and so I've told Allergan the same exact thing. I, I, I've, I've said this from the roof. It never made any sense to me. I think Allergan would be, I think that when we use Cabela, it's when we have little small areas that need to be touched up and whatever. And if you've got a divot in, a, in the inner thigh, if, if, if that's what you're asking, uh, yes, you could use it there. If we have liposuction and you have a little area that's not there, there's not, a, there's not an applicator that'll work there, then you could touch up areas with the Kybella. But I've never understood why you would put Kybella in a, in a, in a submental area where you've got the risk of facial nerve injury, where the incidence was 3 to 4% in the clinical trials when they were trying to, to be very careful, and it, and it swells up like a freaking toad and it hurts for two or three weeks, <laughs> uh, and you've got swelling, and you could do that with a cool sculpting mini, a couple of three patients, and you're done. I, I, I just, it's, it's insane to me. So I don't, that's why cool sculpting's up here, 
and they're tr still trying to figure out. There's some people, I'm sure a lot of you use it, but I don't know why. I just use it for touch-up. It just doesn't make any sense. There's too much downtime. There's too much pain, and you don't get any of that with cool sculpting. So, oh, all right, team. Yeah, here you go.